afternoon, good evening, Iowa soccer supporters. Welcome to Soccer Talk. I'm Ben Brackett here with my good buddy and co-host, Sievers. What's up? I forgot to give you your first name. Blake Sievers. Same, uh, same co-host for the previous 70 plus episodes. So is this episode 80? Is it 80 now? This is the big 8-0. Well, our guest today is nearing 80, so it kind of <laughs> works out well together, doesn't it, Ben? I love it. Uh, we've got uh, LaVon in the studio today as well, so apologize for any barks throughout the uh, next hour plus. You know what I say about the only, the only good dog is. <laughs> good Lord. Uh, hopefully we don't offend too many uh, listeners with that. Uh, so hopefully everybody knows our, our good friend Matt Kennedy. I'm sure most people do. Um, but we have him in the studio today to chat about his, his life and uh, career in the game of soccer here in Iowa. Should we just get to it, Ben? I love it. All right. Welcome, Matt Kennedy, to the pod. Coach, what's up? Thanks for having me, man. I'm just, you know, living the dream. This is a, a special edition. Not beers on the table, but today we're tequila on the table. Tequila on the table. Yes. Cheers, Cheers. Coach. Cheers. Um, we're re- really happy to have you on. Uh, good to see your face. Uh, Steve's, he said he's been listening, so he must know what's coming. Yeah, do you know, uh, do you know where we're going right now, Matt? I first question. A, first I have, question. I have a feeling. First question is always the same. Okay. Is this the first podcast you've ever been on? Yes. Dang. I like it. We've, but I've, uh, been, I've been on television before, so that's, does that count? <laughs> we'll yeah. find out. We've had a few. The last few people we've had uh, have all been on a it's podcast. Sort of, it's so. sort of shocking that we've got Kennedy on on TV when they could have him on radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got the face, right? He's got the radio voice. <laughs> How? Uh, what were you on TV for? Playing. I played. Oh, well, you never, like, so you just did little short um, interviews. I did voiceovers. Short, short like, interviews. Yeah, that and what, games, games that were on TV. Oh, you did, like, commentary? Some, when I was injured, yeah. Oh, I love it. I would love to get my hands on a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> those are fun. They're all bleeped out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, we usually start off after the, the, the first question, which is kind of like the soccer origin story, and both Blake and I probably know most of your origin story, or parts of your origin story, but why don't you give us just a... Uh, you know, talk about how you started playing and um, talk about your career and then your coaching career and kind of what brought you to Des Moines and what you've been up to. It's a long story, I'm sure. That's, yeah, 60 some years long. <coughs> 60, um, not exactly sure how many. <laughs> I won't go that far back. Actually, I started, my brother was a coach and he got married when I was in fifth grade. And he and his wife. How much older was he? 14 years. Okay, that so makes sense. <laughs> he and his wife moved to Florida and I. I used to go down every summer. He coached youth soccer, and I played, not having a soccer background, playing baseball, football, basketball, everything but soccer. So that's how I actually got started in fifth grade, just rec soccer, basically. Um, went down every year till I was a junior in high school, and then actually stayed there and played high school soccer for him in Jacksonville, Florida. And you grew up in Pennsylvania? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And So were you playing in Pennsylvania rec, and then you would just go down there and no, play? No, I never played. You? I just went down there for the summer. And I didn't actually start <laughs> playing for a club team in Pennsylvania until I was a senior in high school. That was 1976. <laughs> <laughs> how did that even, how, how, like, what position were you playing then? Right? You couldn't have been playing goal at that point. I was playing goalkeeper. So that's the only position you played? I played on the field. I actually played on the field in the professional team. Because we had, in the ASL years ago, you had yellow card suspensions. I guess they do that everywhere. But um, we were overloaded with suspension, so I had to play center back, and the backup goalkeeper played, so I was in goal. Got a, got a red, not a red card, I took a guy down in the box for a penalty over my <laughs> backup keeper. <laughs> <laughs> that was long. It was in Jacksonville, Florida, actually, you're playing in Jacksonville. All right, well, let's not jump ahead too okay, far yet. Yeah. Slow down a little bit. Um, uh, so I went down there every summer until I was a junior, and I went to high school down there with him, and I played, I, uh, I tried out for the team, not being really in organized soccer, and I beat out a guy who was a freshman. I would have been a junior that year. He was a freshman. I beat him up, maybe because I was the coach's brother. And, and to a lot of those guys, I was the coach's <laughs> son because I was that much younger. But um, I, I played that year, and I did really well. We went to the state tournament. Uh, we lost 2-1 in the finals. But um, then I got, <coughs> through that experience, I, I attended a camp in Atlanta for like a World Cup soccer camp back in 75. 76, 77, um, 
and got connected with some professional NASL guys that ran the camp and coaches that came in and guest players and um, did that for three years. And I, and I went back to Pennsylvania my senior year because my mother had some health issues and she wanted me to be home, close to home when I was in school. So I graduated from Pennsylvania, uh, Penn State High School in Levittown, Taylor School, Pennsylvania. <coughs> and uh, um, got a scholarship to LaSalle College. What kind of scholarship? An athletic scholarship. Okay. Obviously not an academic one. Because <laughs> okay. I, I, was, I was going to be surprised if that was the I had to work really hard on my academic part. But um, I got an athletic scholarship. Um, I think I paid $26 a semester on geometry for my freshman year. That's crazy. Um, I got injured the last preseason. Right when I got appointed as a starting keeper, I got injured in the last preseason game. I broke my leg. Coming out on the breakaway, I broke my femur. Um, I was in a cast all the way up to my chest. Did you break your femur? It, like just oh, well, we, the, the, they, they slide the, into you. Beginning of the second half, we tried an offside trap, and it didn't work. So the ball came over the top, and I come running out the edge of the box, and I go to clear it. And as I kick it, the guy swings at the ball and hits me right in the knee joint. So oh, it's, it's the medial condyle of the femur. If you so, if you got the two knots at the, the bottom of the femur, it's, it broke off between the two knots. It didn't break off; it just broke. Well, it sounds like your starting position wasn't very good then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't, Start I didn't, a little uh, higher, and you'll, uh, you would have came out and got the ball a little half second quicker. And that's right. If I was better off my line, it would have been a different story. <laughs> <laughs> I learned to be really good off my line after that. Um, no, so then I transferred. My brother got a college job in North Carolina at Belmont Abbey College in uh, Belmont, North Carolina. I didn't realize you played for him there. Yeah, I played for him there uh, one year. Actually, I, I transferred, and I guess so to go from Division One to NAIA, you have to miss a year. Although I didn't play, I didn't play my freshman year. I redshirted. I still, because you transfer down, you have to, you miss a year. So I missed a year. So my junior year, I was actually the first year I played college soccer, and I had a really good year. We had a good team, a lot of international guys, um, and uh, I got approached by coach from Atlanta, which is where I did that soccer camp for my junior, senior year in high school. And uh, they wanted to draft me in the NSL. And then my brother used to do camps with the Tampa Bay Rowdies. And <clears throat> he was well connected down there because he did the Tampa Bay Rowdy camp for years. And they wanted to draft me. And then I was from Philadelphia. So Philadelphia was interesting because I was a hometown boy. Me. So it was kind of it was kind of a neat experience. You know, I, I gave up, I had to write a letter and give up my senior year to enter the draft, and I entered the draft, and I thought I was going to go to Atlanta. I was like all excited because I had so many friends in Atlanta from doing the camps down there. And uh, I went to Philadelphia, traded up, and took me in the first round. So, give everybody about uh, the NASL. I mean, I think we know, but there may be a lot of people that don't. North American Soccer League. It was the top league because there was still the ASL, and then there was the MISL, which was the indoor league. It's the same thing; all ran concurrently. Um, so it, it's. It, I want to say it's similar to the MLS, but it's it would be that back in that day it would be that level of competition. Yeah, it was as good as you could get. Well, yeah, you had players like Beckenbauer and Niskins and Cruyff. And, and so, th and this was the time when you know, like that was the, the you know the Cosmos, like Pele right. came play for the Cosmos. Yep. When Cruyff was playing in uh, DC. DC, Franco Barisi came over, didn't he? Barisi? Barisi? All right. Anyway, so I mean, up? who did uh, <laughs> who did you play against? Like, who were some of the bigger names that we would know. Um, we played against, uh, I told you Roughnecks had players, but the Pelé was the biggest draw. Did Beckenbauer. you play against him? No, I didn't play. Actually, he was supposed to play my, the first game he came over, but whatever happened, he just did the PR thing, did an appearance, and didn't play. Um, as it was, I ended up getting uh, sent down to the a lower level team because they had two top keepers in Philadelphia. So I went to Pennsylvania. Uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's called the Pennsylvania Stoners. Go figure, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I played there in, in like a minor league for the year. And then after that, I, I played indoor. That same winter, I played indoor for the Philadelphia team. I got blown from Fury, Philadelphia Fury, to the Philadelphia Fever and played there for a year. <laughs> what great names, the Fever and the Fury. Um, so I played there. And actually, my very first game that I played in, Walt Chiswick's was doing the color comedy. I was a backup keeper, and the starting keeper got injured. And it was 
was like the third quarter, and I went in, and the first shot, one of the first shots I stopped was the penalty kick. And he went nuts. I have the tape at home. I have the DVD at That's home. That's pretty cool. So, he, and he just goes nuts, you know. And my mom was watching it. She could only watch it on TV. She could never watch it in person. But it was, it was kind of too cool. stressful for her? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what were, uh, what, do you remember what you were making back, way oh, back then? Gosh. We had an apartment. We got an apartment in a car. My rookie, my rookie um, contract. We got an apartment in a car, usually with another player or two. Um, and I was with Tony Glavin, actually, who was the, uh, owned, had the, the ASL club. St. Louis. St. Louis, right? St. Louis. Uh, called Tony Glavin. There used to be, club. yeah. There used to be Tony Glavin soccer club. Right. And and, uh, and he played with the Steamers for a lot of years. And ends up staying there. I'm good friends with him and his wife. And uh, so he and I were roommates. So it was kind of funny. And then the bot the Yugoslavian guys lived right above us. They were a ton of Yugoslavian kids. But um, yeah, we got an apartment and a car, and I, I, like 2,500 bucks a month. That's pretty good, though. And that was 1979. That's so the, yeah, that's for a I'm guy, saying. a 20 year old kid coming out of college. It's like, yeah, you know, heaven. So, so you, I mean, you left school early, and that's, I mean, were a lot of other players doing stuff like that? Um, it, you know, it was like, yeah, kids left. I think, it, I think the idea was for me, just to get in and, you know, I had so such a good experience at that camp in Atlanta with a lot of the professional players and coaches, and, um, and I developed really well. So I had good training, I had good coaching, and I, I, I think one of the things you I talked about in the podcast earlier that I listened to was uh, getting out of your comfort zone, going, challenging yourself yeah. someplace outside of what you're... Sounds like you were doing that straight away. I mean, just, I can imagine just in high school going to, like, live with your brother or something like that. I mean, that's... I mean, obviously it worked out and everything, but uh, I'm sure it wasn't because you were getting in trouble or anything like that either. No, I have six sisters. You know? So, <laughs> so you're my, doing brother, anything my, to get brother, my brother's gone from, he was in the seminary actually before he got married and went to Florida. But, um, you know, I had six sisters at home. And I was like, no, it's not a place, it's crazy. Uh, now looking back <laughs> as, as an older person, looking back, it's, it's like, like six oh, mothers. <laughs> it was worse than that, trust me. <laughs> Are you the youngest? No, I have two younger sisters, four gotcha. older sisters. Yeah, so, so you're obviously putting yourself outside your comfort zone. Uh, you played pro through, what, what year was it then? I, I drafted, Mid 80s? I drafted in 79, and I played till 1989. Wow. Nine, ten seasons. Indoor, outdoor, different leagues. USL, played in North Carolina in 83 and 84. In the ASL, it was the ASL one year, and it was the USL, because the ASL folded. It was one of those things where there's always somebody coming up with a new league. Um, I mean, the competition was, there was some, still some good foreign players, kind of like, you know, like the NASL was so many, you know, you had Chip Canalia, you had uh, Neeson, Beckenbauer, Pele, uh, the goalkeepers, um, Birkenmeyer, uh, Yassine played in New York. You know, there's, you know, Chet Messing was probably the best American keeper at the time. He was, you know, somebody that was a huge personality. Do you guys remember the, what's the movie, the documentary on the NASL? That you, it was, it's a pretty good one. It came out, I don't know, five, ten years, five years ago or something, but um, I suppose if people Google it, I would uh, recommend Talk about the cosmos yeah. and Pele coming over. And yeah, all that. we'll also have to find that link of uh, like the old soccer jerseys that I sent you. It has, it has, I've ever shown you this. It's like, it's, I mean, there's pictures of you in, in like almost every, like three or four different teams mm -hmm. um, in your old like retro kit. And, uh, I mean, it, it, it gives a good picture of like all the different players that were playing at that time, too. I mean, it, the list is just, I mean, it's extensive. Uh, so you look, you look back on that picture pretty fondly. Yeah, and it's, you know, I was thinking about it when I was pulling up in front here, and I was like, you know, what, how many people really get to play professional soccer, play a professional sport, period, you know, and it was a great opportunity, and like you asked Justin, I think, yeah, I was listening to that podcast, you know, would they change anything? I guess if I would change anything, I would have gone it's back better to better starting position? No. <laughs> 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 well, if it wasn't for that good starting position, he may have never gone to <laughs> Belmont Abbey, and... Exactly. <laughs> no, I would. I, I think that the only thing I would have changed is make sure that I got my college, you know, finished college next yeah. year. Yeah. So, other than that, it's a great experience. It was fun. It was. Did you start coaching at that time too? Yeah, I started in Minnesota when I went to Minnesota in '84. Um, play indoor for the Strikers. Um, buddy, my best friend, my college roommate, was there, and he owned a soccer store. And That's Dave Jensen. Dave Jensen. And we know Dave. Yeah, yeah. you guys worked at. We well, spent a few. A few weeks up at USA Cup. <laughs> yeah, right, and, uh, USA Cup stuff. And uh, we did, um, I started a club called Mangu up in 84, and I have 
you know, the first tournament we ever went to was the Pikes Peak Invitational. Now, nice. Every time we'd go there on the bus ride there, the stories the kids were on, it was, it was, you could just imagine, <laughs> you know, myself, only me, and 18, 20 teenagers on a bus to Colorado. So, so um, it was a great, it was a great experience, and, you know, I, I, I keep in touch with quite a few of them still, actually. It's kind of neat. And then, so that was in 80, 84, 85, 86. 87. So I got there in 84 and I played till 87. And I started Bangu and then I, I kind of put myself up in the auction block because I had a really good season in Minnesota. Again, I, I did my ACL the first year I was there in 84. So I had another setback. Came back a little too soon and but played in 80, 85. Played in 85, 86. I had a really good season, 86, 87 season. And then I, I took a contract in Wichita, which was my last year playing. I was down there, and <clears throat> again, I thought I played pretty well. I had another injury. Um, decided that I got kicked in the face, and I broke my cheekbone. And I, I remember hearing this story. I was wondering what happened to your face. That made <laughs> sense. No, but this is, isn't this the, like, because you had to wear a mask. Yeah, I did. Right? I still have that helmet, too. I had a practice helmet. It was a hockey, a Gyopa hockey helmet. And, and then the one that the, the MISL approved was padded with uh, half-inch foam. So it was all white and around it. I wore it one game, and the general manager of the Wichita Wings, Roy Turner, said, we lost on a deflection in the fourth quarter. So he goes, guys, you're going to have to wear that mask and not be playing tonight. So I took the mask off. We were in Tacoma at the time. So I took it off, and we played in L.A. We won, and we're still in the hunt for the playoffs. And then we went down to San Diego, who was the top team in the MISL. And, uh, you know, unfortunate for me, Bronco Sagoda hit the ball off the boards. I don't know if you know Bronco Sagoda. He had legs like trunks and he could just thump the ball like you wouldn't believe. And he took a shot and <laughs> made a face save. You know, <laughs> sa same place, same oh. place, rebroke it, fell back, hit the, hit the boards, and uh, that was my decision was to quit playing, actually. That sounds scary, to be honest. <laughs> uh, were you guys, I mean, if you're Wichita to Tacoma to uh, California, you get bus in? No, we're flying. Everything was flight. In the MIS. Like back in the day when you could like smoke on the plane. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> exactly. That must have been interesting. Pro the flights home were probably fun if you guys won. What's that? The flights home were probably fun oh, yeah. if you got if you guys won. It didn't matter. It didn't be, <laughs> a lot of these English guys, it didn't matter. You're you're you're, you're having fun. I mean, the game. Beers on the coach on the plane. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you guys are you guys are flying commercial. I mean, are people yeah recognizing you? In and out of Minnesota, it was when we were in Minnesota. I mean, Wichita was huge because that was the only thing in Wichita. We were, I mean, the Wichita Wings were, everybody knew the Wings. Everybody came from all over the place to fill that place. So, yeah, that was fun. Cool. So, you, uh, so 89, you say, all right, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. And, and you're I, in Wichita. Let's go ahead. So, I leave uh, Wichita. I go back to Minnesota because I spent three years there and I had a lot of friends and I kept coaching with Dave and doing the USA Cup and um, and then in 91 I got a, actually I was doing the camp the Global Figure Soccer Academy um, and we were traveling and uh, the lady in charge of Iowa United at the time Ramona Barber and the board Mike Harrison and uh, a handful of other people um, were looking for a director of coaching or program director and they contacted Hubert because a lot of kids from Des Moines Ramona, Tommy Barber, and, and uh, Liza, and quite a few kids had attended the camp. So they contacted Hubert, and Hubert recommended me. So um, Mike Harrison came out to Santa Barbara while we're doing the camp to interview me and, and watch me work and, and see if it was, uh, you know, if it would be a good fit. So they offered me a job in 91. <coughs> so I came right after camp ended in September. I, and I, end of August, I came right from camp from Minnesota down here, and it was kind of awkward because it, it, honestly, we went. I didn't even I didn't even do any training sessions. So we went right to the Tranquility Park. What's that term? Cornhusker. Yeah. We went right. I went right to Cornhusker without even doing any training sessions with these kids. And I show up, and some of the older kids like Brad Proctor and Tommy Barber and Kevin Brucey and Ryan Mons were like. You're the guy from camp. What are you doing here? It's like, like a nightmare, right? So, <laughs> Can you imagine? Because if you ever went to the camp, it, it was like it was so intense. It was yeah. so high energy. You know? Did you ever do Volga Chamber? I did not. It, it was, it, I it, did it for a week, and it was like 
It was by the end of the, by the end of the week, you're like, okay, I guess I could just keep doing this forever. But for the first three days, you're like, this yeah, is the it's worst. So, it's so hard. It's the worst. And that's that was the response I got from half the kids oh, that yeah. attended it. So, uh, and then I, and every summer, I literally took. We were going. We we won state cup. In those days, Iowa United was the name of the club here. In those days, Iowa United won just about everything. And so that's it. just for Iowa United. Um, that's kind of tour evolved in a bunch. But that's a, for everybody. The, Six Karen Grand Alibur complex that became Iowa United, then became the Menace. Now it's Des Moines yeah. Soccer Club. Yeah. Oh, it was Fusion, now it's Des Moines Soccer Club. Yeah, okay. Um, but Iowa United was like the preeminent club at the time. And I mean, you pulled from everyone. You weren't just, it wasn't just like Des Moines kids. No, or we, Roosevelt kids. It was. No. Well, all I, had of kids from, I had kids from Pella. I had kids from Newton. I had uh, Kevin Bruce, and he was now a doctor in town, uh, came from Council Bluffs. So we had. I didn't realize he came from that far. We had. Uh, you know, it was, it was, plus it was us in West Des Moines, there was nobody else, you know, that, that was on the team. And we probably had, you know, over the span of the time I was there, you know, you had, you had Bill Keppen coaching, you had J.R. Fernandez coaching. Um, For Iowa United? Yeah. Well, so that was, I mean, I just remember, because I started Iowa United as like a U11, so, and you would have been maybe in your, I don't know what year at that point. I think you, you, like Frank Gurnick came around. Frank Gurnick came in after I, I left in '94. Oh, so that's why I missed out. I left in '94. Went to Houston for two years. Ran a club in Houston for two years. Then I went to San Diego. Worked with Hubert uh, off season camp stuff and ran his club down in San Diego. And then I came back here in '99. And, and yeah, it was like five years, right? Is that what it was? Four, just four. Okay. And in '99, I came back here and back to Iowa United. And um, I think that was the best staff we ever had. It was me, Bill, Kepin. Casey Mann was coaching at the time, and J.R. Fork was four really good coach, really good soccer. You know, was, was, was Aaron James was there too, right? He was he was one of the assistant coaches. Yeah, yeah. That okay. was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. well, because I, I played I played for you and him. Like I remember, because it was Sievers and I, we were playing for Seth. Seth right. was I mean, he was another team coach, right? Yep. Um, and I would come play up with you guys, and uh, Aaron James and you were just I mean, I, you were a totally different breed. <laughs> <laughs> you were the first coach that ever swore at me. <laughs> wannabes. Did I'm you ever do wannabe seeds? <laughs> no, I didn't uh, swear in wannabes. You definitely did. <laughs> no way. Yeah. So it was, it was just pretty, it's pretty uh, tame. I, I, I feel like you just said like, you know, you know, like something about get your damn head down or, or something like that. It was good. Yeah. yeah, there's, I mean, you go back through the history of Iowa United, though, uh, the players, but then the coaches, I mean, there's kind of the who's who of oh, yeah. the history of Iowa soccer. Yeah, absolutely. Or Des Moines, for sure, at least. Absolutely. Uh, well, you guys both coached there. You coached at Iowa United, or no, you coached no. Menace. Oh, well, yeah, it was, I mean, Iowa United uh, sort of ceased to exist, I would say. 2002. Yeah, I, I was going to say something right about when we were wrapping up our club careers. Yeah. Because I, I actually met with Kyle, and I said, wouldn't it be a great thing to have a youth program? I, I could have presented it to him, and I, I believe it was 2001, and it actually did it at the end of the 2001 season, the 2002 tryout. So, um, you know, we met three or four times, and whether I had to convince him or it was something that he just really was interested in, I thought it would be a great opportunity for, you know, the, the next level of having kids go someplace different after college and, and have an opportunity to play PBL. That was like Super Wiley time. Yeah. 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 The yeah. reason for the demise of Iowa United, clearly Matt Kennedy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The exactly. beginning and <laughs> the end. He, yeah. Wanted, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he wanted to keep control. <laughs> <laughs> there's no controlling when you're involved with the United people. So. Well, there's no controlling when you're uh, – charge of a board of how many parents and oh it's crazy I, I remember tryouts it's funny you say that because we used to do tryouts and then you'd have to go into this boardroom with 12 board members and present each and every rock this thing would go on for serious yeah, and, and so this was I late would 90s nice. though yeah, yeah yeah so the board members decided the coach how to staff, say in the tryout the coach, uh, mind you there's no computers back then sure so you're everything's on on hand in papers and you're going and you're Presenting your roster, and they're asking why or why a play up, and you know sure. why why are you allowing this person to play up and not that person to play up, and that, you know, and you have to justify and rationalize everything you're doing, which is, I mean, I, literally they went to midnight, some Very of these board meetings, and it was it was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, and, and back then, I mean, those were, if I remember correctly, I mean, a lot of those parents and board members had a, a ton to do with just like the beginning of soccer and making it exactly. like I mean, what it was. Yeah, you had like Kim Walker was there, Mona Barber, Kim Sullivan, yep. Mike Harrison, um, Neil, uh, what was that kid's name that left the Mountain? 
Well, for all you coaches out there that complain about tryouts, like think about having the board Good members board. Uh, actually have a say. have a say in that. Yeah, that's, that's unbelievable. That's crazy. It's crazy. And it's, you know, and, and and nowhere else, nowhere else is that. I mean, they usually you present the, the roster to the board and stamp it and it's done. But here it was, it was, a, it was a little bit of a control mechanism, I think. But it, you know, we really, you know, like you, we've got the best players. We've got the best players and put them in the best opportunity. And we really had to rationalize why we cut a kid, especially if a kid had been on the team for a couple of years or. You know why we have a playoff. Yeah, and I mean that was back in the day too. There, there were no, there's no B team. You either no. got you got no. accepted to the team, you got right. an alternate bid maybe, right? Um, or you got straight up cut. And right. you, a lot of people like you did get cut. It right. wasn't like, uh, hey, we'll just give everybody an alternate bid and we'll maybe you'll you know you'll be the tenth guy down the line or whatever. So just don't feel too bad because you're still an alternate. It was like, you know, we've got two alternates and then you're just straight up cut. Yeah, and, and there there was no gray area. You exactly that. And and. You know, now you, you, as we talk about, parents overwhelmingly want to have a, you know, you know, we actually had to do twice a year evaluations because I United. I, had, I found the format for the other day. I was going to bring it in. But you had to do twice a, twice a year evaluations, which I don't mind. You know, I don't mind that. But, you know, and that, and that would really go towards their file, their player's file for the trial period. So when we went to the board and we said, this is, this is the deal, it's not against me. And for you, it's easy because you're super engaged. Like that's just the way you are. Like you're yeah. like, of course I know this about my players. And right. value it's easy for you to probably run through and do that. Yeah. It would have been nice if you would have brought that or anything in. Would it have been? Yeah. been? That's right. <laughs> and he came empty-handed again. Oh, he's too busy. He was too busy bringing sandwiches. That's right. <laughs> uh, so I think that to me, you uh, like I think of you as an Army United guy. Like that's just you know I, don't, I barely even think about maybe what you what you did. But that was because it affected me at the time. Um, but you've now ultimately coached for, I mean, not, not every club around, but you've coached for a lot of the different clubs in town. Yeah, I've, I've been uh, Iowa United, obviously. I was at VSA um, after I came back from one of my attempted moves. I think it was to Atlanta in 2007. I went to VSA. I actually coached with Carlos at, at Waukee at the same time. Yep. Um, I did the goalkeepers. VSA had a, an agreement with the Ankeny, so I would do goalkeepers at VSA one day a week, and then I would go to Ankeny and do their keepers twice a week. So oh, I, how would that go nowadays? Oh my gosh, <laughs> that would, you can you can get away with doing that kind of stuff. I mean, you've but, done. You know, I think in, in a specialty position like goalkeepers, I, I don't think it should matter. I don't think it should either. <laughs> it, it'd be hard. You'd, you'd be hard pressed to get get away with it today. I would think. But right? even me as a, as a goalkeeper and a goalkeeper coach to try to even do personal training with keepers outside of a club that I'm working for, people would say, oh, you're recruiting. Because this, this is the stuff that happens. Right. I mean, I remember you know, when I first came back here and I used to go watch Roosevelt's high school play. And Dan McCain was a coach. I don't know if you know Dan McCain, but he was the, 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 the Cess, uh, he was like oh, the greatest, yeah, yeah, yeah. the undefeated. The greatest yeah. motivator. He didn't know That's a thing right. about soccer. Great guy. But I would stand outside the fence and th these, these Valley parents would say, oh, he's coaching high school. He's coaching the, the He's coaching the kid because back then you couldn't coach the kids in club and high school because it was a, a suspension. Oh, still can't. And, and so they would report me like I was coaching behind the fence or something, and I was like, you know, dude, sort of that. But you know, it was most of the kids. And, I, and actually, oddly enough, back in those days, you had even Seth's team and the team under him was a lot of West Des Moines kids. You know, Billy Scott, Matt, my, Matt Wagner. Matt Wagner was a goalkeeper. Obviously, yeah. Olivencia, you had all those guys. All those guys that came. A uh, friend of yours, a kid from West Des Moines. You don't have that many friends, no, Ben. It's got to be just on a hand. Uh, he had a nickname. I can't remember his name, but I, I, I'm friends with him on Facebook. So is uh, so back when you were was that you were at uh, Ankeny Soccer Club when Oz was there? You were helping the goalkeepers, or was that the Rush? I, I, I don't remember when they. It was 2007. Okay. Ish. So it could have been Oz. It could have been uh, Corbin. Maybe Cor I when Corbin came in and they were. Yeah. Then he, I think they changed to the rush right. somewhere around, around there. Yeah. And Corbin, yeah. And Corbin and came in and brought the rush in. Yeah. yeah. And then you've, I mean, you've coached, done goalkeepers for the Drake men, Drake women. Drake men. I never did the women. I did women at, 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 Sims, at uh, Grandview, men and women at Grandview. Um, You're doing Graceland? I did Graceland last, last fall, fall ago, a year yeah. ago with Ozzy. Good experience. Uh, you know, the commute must not be very fun. It's <laughs> difficult. Yeah, especially when you're when you're doing that and you're coming back 
to do club soccer here. So yeah. it, Did you do anything about it, Simpson? I haven't done this. They called me for some recommendation about goalkeepers or they asked me to come down, but I just, you know, it's, it's so hard. Did to you do. ever go to AIB? No. no yeah. Yeah. So, I, and I think for people who don't, that don't know Matt or have never seen him coach a goalkeeper session, his sessions are pretty unique. They're super intense. I remember in high school participating in one, and it was awful, uh, just to sort of see what it was like. Super, super not fun. Um, but I guess it's just interesting. And this is kind of where I want to, I'm curious as we take this conversation from, you know, hearing your story to like kind of present day. Um, your coaching style is, is probably like a little, little too in your face these days. Would you agree? Or do people, like, do you get that from people still? Yeah, you, you know. Because I, I love your coaching style. It, Don't get me wrong. <laughs> You know, you have to you have to set out an expectation. I think, and I, you know, I learned something you know, working with Bill and working with Hubert Robesinger, especially, and the people on Hubert Robesinger's staff. Something as simple as, you know, if you have a trouble trouble player or player is, is not participating, you know, do you give them all the attention and let the other 18, 19 kids know? So you make a statement with that kid. I said, I'm, I'm you know, no dialogue. <laughs> and the bottom line is, you, you know, you have to you have to make them, you, you have to care about the kids to the point where you want them to really do well and, and let them know. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a trust in that. Like, you know, it's funny, I was watching NFL today and one of the announcers was, was saying that the most successful coaches, even in the NFL, know the personalities of their players. And, and I think that's so huge when you, you learn what buttons you can push, and who, who you can be really rough on, and who you have to <coughs> kind of, I don't want to say stroke, but you have to be a little nicer to. And that's, that's kind of changing with the age, but back in the day, I mean, there was, you know, it was like in your face stuff, and, you know, it, it, you said. How many players do you hear from that, like, just look at that as some of the most, <laughs> like, some of the best coaching they got? Um, I feel like you probably hear that a fair amount that guys are just, oh, I loved it. Thank you, coach. I, I do, and it's funny, it's funny you should say that, because when I was in Minnesota, and I coached uh, Van Gogh, and I coached at the Yana High School at Bays, and this goalkeeper, Tommy Prestis, who played at DC United with uh, Matt Nichol. I think he was there when Matt Nichol was there. He played four or five years there, won a couple championships, and went to Cleveland, you know, and he messaged me a couple years ago, and he goes, you know, along those lines, and it's like, you, know, you get emotional, because yeah, you yeah. get these guys that say, you know, I've, you know, you're looking back, some of the, the stuff that you did there, as hard as it was, really shaped the way I am, and I was like, well, that's what it's about, because we're not just, you know, creating soccer players, we're building young men, we're building, you know, uh, reliability, Accountability, all those things that you know that you could do to take you, make you be sex, successful in Whatever. your normal job. Right. So like on that, you kind of bring up old uh, old players. Give us some. Uh, I mean, you've been out in the Des Moines soccer scene for a long time. We just kind of laid out who uh, you had one. Who was the best Des Moines or Iowa soccer player that you coached? Put you on the spot. I now. know that's that's a, that's a hard one. I hope they're not listening. Um, there, you know, it's hard to say that because there are so many different dimensions to, to people who are successful. Um, Cody Fox was probably the most athletic kid, and he, he was. What year would he have been? He would have been. Uh, oh my gosh, I don't even know. Because I recognize that name, I just he, can't he, place he it. went to Drake for a little bit and. Uh, you know, he was he was kind of like a strong-willed person. He just he didn't buy in very well. But he was the most athletic kid. I think Ryan Monsma, Matt Bobo, solid player. Ryan Mons, I think, was the most natural player. Um, could play anywhere, and and really be comfortable. Um, I think Seth Moderson probably worked the hardest on his skills and his on his craft, and it really benefited him. He he still. He does, he does really well with what he's doing out in California. And, uh, um, and but you, look, you, like, you, you look at these guys and, and yourself, Ben, you know, the, one of the topics you talked with Justin about was uh, what makes players different and better. It's, it's them doing things on their own. And I always told my, the kids on the team, I said, look, it's not what you do at practice. But what, it's what you do every day of the week when you're not at practice. The 15, 20 minutes, half an hour that you would spend working on your skills, doing your dribbling, juggling. It didn't matter. And know? people, uh, I mean, obviously that stuff is, is super important. And a lot of those guys that you mentioned, I'm sure, you know, like Seth is a good one just because, like, we know Seth. And yeah. I, I'm 
sure that Seth was out there working on his own. Um, but you also did some really cool stuff where, I mean, you would just go down there with a bag of balls and you'd hang out and say, hey, everybody want to come down? Yeah, we would do, We, I mean, we did that, I did it with a ton of kids from here, from Iowa United, even with, with BSA, there were three or four kids that I really kind of latched on with. And we would just go and knock balls, you know, knock balls. I remember and striking balls with you just like endlessly. Exactly. And, we would and you would just critique and critique. We should have <laughs> kept going, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's... But it I mean, made a difference. It made a difference for me. I, I, you, you have to... You have to be aware of weaknesses or, or setbacks or personal things that they don't do well. It's like, you know, you want to work on your craft. And like I said, Seth was probably the hardest working person on his craft to do what he did and did well and, and to really be focused and really be intense and kind of a, almost kind of introverted about what he did. But he was he was he's probably the, you know, the it's hardest pretty driven. Person. And there's other guys, you know, uh, you talked about with Justin about, you know, getting kids in college and why aren't kids... Well, here, here's the question. Okay. Yeah. We'll just uh, get to it. Yeah, yeah, since we'll quote it. So, again, uh, Kylie Stannard? Stannard? Stannard. Stannard? He's the coach at Yale now from Cedar Rapids, uh, an Iowa guy. Yeah. What quote? Uh, the question is, what happened to all the Iowa players that used to turn into great college players? The floor is yours, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and part of what brought it up was the – it was like the re, uh, what the anniversary of the Drake Elite Eight run that they did with, you know, predominantly Iowa-based teams. Okay, so and you go back to and then and I'll CRSA back in the day was probably the best team in those age groups. They had they had they cornered the market and, and developed the players up and up and up. We we chat that we were Iowa United was the biggest challenge for them when it got to state cup and everything like that. And, and four or five years down the road. And you're talking like probably in the 2000s. Early 2000s, late yeah. 90s, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, you know, it takes, it takes a, you know, Ben, and you know, you both played Division One. You know, you go and you're basically a scholarship player or you're a professional athlete when you go to Division One. Correct. You know, you, you have to do study table, you have to do health and fitness, you have to do workouts, you have to. You know, there's, home session. Yeah, and there's th that's a commitment that some of these kids don't get. You know, that, you know, you uh, hate to name names. John Choda went to Drake. You know, and probably very, very gifted player, very talented player from Milwaukee. I, I, I love the kid. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, mentally, psychologically, it was out of his league because he couldn't he couldn't focus on all the necessities that you need to do when you're Division One. So. He dropped. He, he left school, went to Iowa, and then went to Grandview. Finished at Grandview. Had a great finish to his career at Grandview. A lot of that I, just, I think sometimes becomes like an experience. Like he needed to have the experience to probably and understand. You know, walk away from the game and go. Actually, you know what? I would rather take it really seriously and make it a full time job or whatever. Yeah, and I had a kid. I had a kid who I thought uh, Brandon Cook from Bondurant who played for me, who was unbelievably gifted. He decided came to our golf outing this, Did he? this Did he? year. Nice. Yeah. I mean. Really talented, really gifted kid, strong on the ball, uh, central midfielder. You know, he decided he was going to go to Iowa his, his freshman year and not play. Six months in, he calls me. He goes, hey, coach, can you help me get him to a college? And I said, sure, where do you want to go? He said, I don't know, I'm looking at So he went to Warford, played four years at Warford, and had a great career at Warford. You know, and, and a lot of times it's finding that right fit. But yeah, it, it is, because I think even with youth soccer and – and college soccer, it's the personality. Your personality has to meld with the coach's personality. In in the personality of the team as well, but I think the coach and player personality and relationship has to be just right for you because otherwise, it's it's not going to be a happy fit. I think a lot of times you hear about, you know, we talk about kids that like go to school and they end up, you know, like they don't last four years or whatever. And I think a lot of times, the the thing that they point to is like, oh, I didn't really get along with the coach. You know, it's not they didn't like dislike the school; they liked the teammates. Right. But but again, you go back to personality of the person, and e even the the mothering. You, you know, it, we used to talk about getting outside your comfort zone and you know being on your own. Because a lot of times when you get to college and you're on your own, your time management's horrible, your study habits are horrible, your eating habits are horrible. Uh, but the, the bottom line is, you know, we go back to the question. We we've got kids that here in our area that have gone to Simpson and done well. You know, and I tell kids, I said, look, if you're going to college. Make two lists. A 
list of schools that you want to go for for an education that has a soccer program that will fit your needs. You go and then, you know, get out of your comfort zone, you know, list a couple of colleges that you want to play at that you could still do an academic program, but the soccer is what you want. So maybe a Division One team um, as opposed to a Division Three. So I, mean, I had a goalkeeper go to um, play for me for four years uh, growing up in high school and went to Woodbury as a freshman last year. And Woody. Woody. And he didn't, he played with the yep. Warners. Warners. And he um, walked, he went in there, you know, negotiated a deal with the academic and whatever package, so, uh, money package, but sat the bench the first game and got the nod the second game and never did. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's those situations that people overlook because there's still, there's still great opportunities for kids to play, Division Three, NAIA. Uh, I know the conversation with Grandview came up and with Justin, and there's so many players at Grandview that, 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 are, that are local kids. But I, I think, uh, you know, one of the big things is, is the Latino community, Hispanic kids, that, um, you know, and it comes up with the Des Moines school football program, you know, the inner city school football pro program, because all those kids play football as well, American football. And, you know, when they get to high school age, they're working in dad's business, you know, and they and they don't have time for that because that's the culture. But there are so many kids that are Spanish, or Latino kids, I don't want to be politically incorrect, but there are so many kids that are gifted and talented in the Latino community that, you know, one, have commitment to family stuff, or two, can't afford it. And you look at these clubs now, and... I mean, there's a club here in town that you know has a team, has four teams deep in every age group, and they call them competitive soccer. That that D team, I'm sorry, the C and D team are rec soccer team, That's right. and they're still paying the same fees that, that the top team are playing. Yeah, and then you talk about the Latino and Hispanic community. Um, you and I both, when we coached for the menace during the last like five years or so ago, um, I mean, you'd, you'd have a team that was maybe not. It, you know, say that you've got like 50% of your squad is, is Latino. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing to see how many how many players had just so many other commitments that weren't, you know, they, they had to happen, right? They were, you know, they did, they had to help them, you know, they had to work, or they had, you know, it's like, man, we were so, we were so lucky. Is, is a big oh, one too. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> well, here's Those a were tease. the worst. <laughs> here's a tease for the next, next podcast. We've got Jack Simons, the Lincoln Boys coach. Uh, coming next week that we're going to get into. Good guy. Yeah. Him. He's, yeah. Nice. So he's, just, he's doing a great job over there. So like a lot of things you guys said, though, there's kids, the kids are struggling to go to school, let alone get to soccer, let alone just because. And now you have this COVID thing, and they have to go remotely, and I'm sorry, but some kids just can't sit and look at a computer. It, it just doesn't do them any favors. I can't imagine you sitting in front of a computer. Oh, I hate computers. <laughs> I, have, I have a brand new one I got for my birthday last year. I don't, I don't, I get on it for my work stuff, and that's it. And I don't even like it. I can't even imagine you. Uh, <laughs> so, so to me, it, it, uh, you know, I think the thing that keeps coming up is it, it, I mean, is it a is it a generational difference? Is that is that is it that simple? Is it like well, there's just there's so much more going on, there's so much more to deal with now that focusing on something like your your craft as a soccer player is just not a priority? Or can you be I'll kind of back in on that? Can you be as demanding? Because it seems like right now, just from an outsider, like now I'm not coaching anymore, but. It seems like coaches can't, don't, aren't as demanding of players as they used to be. I don't know what you. Uh, that's I, I, th I think opinion. I think I you can still be. I wouldn't change that. I would still be the way I am because that's just me. And I think, uh, you know, call me a Bobby Knight, old school kind of coach, but you have to set expectations. You have to set guidelines for what's acceptable behavior, what's acceptable level of talent. Well, and the, th the things that you're talking about, at least if I remember, you know, some of the things is just like. Uh, the way you speak to people, res you know, responding with yeah. yes as opposed to yeah or yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Excuse me. You know, yeah. things like that. I mean, but, I used to make them do push-ups. Yep. You know, even at camp, I would do it. I'd get in trouble at camp from the camp manager because, you know, you don't you don't speak. To, you don't. That's funny because when I worked in uh, North Carolina after my brother passed away a couple years ago, I went to a club in Winston Salem, and we went and the the guy who I replaced went to DC United as a youth program director. And we went up there to play some friendlies. And I, I was shocked. These 11-year-old kids who, I mean, if you've gone down to Kansas City and watch sporting 11- or 12-year-old kids play, they, they're like, they play like professionals. 
all the kids on the team against my under 13 team down there came up and introduced themselves to me. The DC United coach. kids? Yeah, uh, DC United kids, 12 year old kids. Hi, coach. Uh, welcome to DC. Thanks for coming. My name's. I mean, this was a professional mentality, and you know. That's the kind of stuff that you talk about when these kids are, you know, 18 or yeah. 22. They're going for their first job. It's gonna. Exactly. But it's one of those things where, like I said earlier, it's like you just you, you got to prepare them for life in, in in the real world because soccer. You know, I was a fortunate individual to play professional soccer, and you know, people have dreams and aspirations of doing any professional sport or sport at a high level. Um, you know, because you're a little bit ahead of your time too. Like, you can't yeah, tell me that at like sure. 15 or 16 you were sitting there going, "I want to play pro soccer." Like at 15 or 16, you were like, "Okay, I'll go play in college." And, and no, like, I actually after the camps, I, I I wanted to play professional soccer. Okay, and, and I knew, you know, it's one of the things like Justin said. You know, you go to park and you and you have kids kicking around. That's what kids need to do. They need to go spend time on their own. Um, I've got a group of kids that played for me at, at Menace FC United that will go over to Altoona on the turf and they won't ever get kicked off there. They go there almost every day. And they Luckily, play. nobody listens to this <laughs> podcast. <in Southwest. laughs> but they go there and they play or they go to Johnston and play on the turf in Johnston. And, and you know, it's 8, 10, 12 of them. They go play small side games or do some goalkeeping stuff. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff. I remember when I was a little kid and used to play baseball. We used to go, four or five of us would go to play, you know, hit balls and, and then four more would show up and we'd play six against six, close left field, close right field, and we play. And, you know, because that's what we wanted to do. Yeah. And, but that was then, this is now. I mean, the, the computers, the phones, the games, the... the TV, the internet. The, yeah, TV, internet. The, the fields are closed. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, yeah, yeah. all those things. It, it, it's crazy. I, I, you know, there's so many distractions now for these kids. And, <laughs> and I think, that, you know, one of the, one of the things that... We, we do have good players here. There are, there are quality players here, and I just think that you know, we've got to do a better job of identifying them and, and setting them up. I had a kid that played for me that we sent up to Minnesota United for a, a couple tryouts, and they really liked him, an African kid, and they really liked him. And, and unfortunately, Minnesota United dropped their youth program, and it's it got picked up by somebody else. But he was he was in the mix to go up there, and you know, like Justin said, sending kids down to Kansas City. So you know, and and to send kids away, you know, like him. He actually went to another club. I, I, I folded my team up this year. And, and, you know, I, you can't, I can't be mad. He's going to play with better players, and I watched him play in, a, in, in State Cup, and I, he was amazing. And, you know, he did really, really well. And I was like, you know, when you play with better players and you're good, you, you know how much easier that is and how much how, how much more success you can have. So you got to give him a, you know, a pat on the back for good stuff. So what do you think then, like, as a, a whole, like, if you just look at the Iowa player pool, um, I think no doubt it's in increased in size. It's probably increased in quality. Um, but what do you think? Uh, you know, I, I, I got to go with something that Justin mentioned. Um, I, I agree that there are too many clubs. I, I think if, if there were a core club, and this is what I tried to do with the Menace years ago, you know, try to bring in. I even, we even sat in John Pearson's living room. Years ago, me, Frank Gernick, John Pearson, uh, guys from West Des Moines, guys from Ankeny, and we thought, oh, look, here's the pool of players. Let's put the players here, and we're out here. You, you have players are going to have an a, a, a attachment to some certain coaches, but we bring all the players here, and and you play. You're doing the 14s, you're doing the 16s, you're doing the 18s, girls, boys, however. And, but all the players come to the same hub, and, you know, nobody bought in. And it's just, you know, you're protecting their livelihood, and I think it's even, it's even uh, more obvious now that certain people are protecting their livelihood and with their income and their salary and, and how things work. But I think, uh, you know, ideally, if, if, you know, I don't want to bash anybody, but I think if, if everybody was in it for the right reasons or player development, then they would find a way to create a system that everybody, the best players go to. And what kind of system would you create? Like if you could, if you could make it. Ideally, I, and I think this is, you know, something that would be along a professional line where you, the kids, the best players play for free. Uh, I think you, you, and that's the way you get the best players. It's kind of like an academy list, an MLS academy. The, the, the players want to go there. They, they try out and they work on their own skills, their their craft to, to 
get to that group of players. You talk, you talk about the pathway, right? That we always, we always hear about the pathway. What's the, what is the, what are you, if, you're not, if you don't have a place to go? You have to have a facility, you have to have a sponsor, you have to have someone with a deep pocket that's going to, you know, there's, there's a way we talked about it, if I were not years ago, that if you were in the club at wannabes, 11s, 12s, 13s, 14s, you know, you, you didn't pay or you got reduced fees, 16, 17, 18. So, so there was a, a payback for um, loyalty. Exactly, for loyalty. And I, I think, you know, uh, and that's, that's something that we said about that. I mean, the writing may be on the wall with the pro Iowa. I mean, yeah. I, if they, if, I have no idea, but if they would have an academy at the USL yeah, I think pro level. There are a lot of people that were pissed off when he dropped the youth program, but I get it. You know, I, I totally understand that if he wants to be, if the pro Iowa State wants to be a community based program, then you can't have ties to a, a to any one club. You have to you have to allow all those kids to come in, and I think that's, you know, you, you know, you could be disappointed and you get pissed a little bit, but I think the decision was the right decision for the right reason, really. And now he can he can get his organization, get his facility, his stadium, whatever he, what, his whatever he's going to do, and. And really, you know, maybe start that way. Have a even if you just have one team, you know, an eighteen-year-old team or a nineteen-year-old yep. team that the, you know, that, that the community has a, a chance to look up to. That hey, I want to go there. I want to play on that team. I want to be part of that pro Iowa. I mean, that's kind of how when the menace was around. When we were playing with the menace, that, that yeah. was the. That was how we I thought that was pretty cool, right? Yeah. You were. We, we came in late. What were we? Fifteen, sixteen when the menace came. But like that was the, like. That, that back then, that was the goal to play for the. And you got chances first too. Team. Like we got chances to go train. Like yeah. You get, you, if, if, uh, well, I mean, you know, there was a kid in, in Ankeny that actually gave up a senior year to play with the Menace. Never saw the field. Jack Dillinger. Oh, that's right. He, he gave. He, you know, he chose to go because he was a solid defender. I mean, had some limitations, but he he was a solid defender, and he chose to play PDL and give up a senior year. And you know, he was probably the only one. But that. That's the idea. Not that you want to give up your senior year, because I think there's something to be said for playing for your high school. There's, it, it's just, it's just. When you've coached, cool. at, you've coached at Roosevelt, you've coached at Hoover, and Waukee, and Waukee. So I mean, you get it. I, I get the fact that you want to play for high school, and, and there's, you, you can't make them not play for that high school. It's just, you just can't do that. I, I just think there's, you know, there's something about the pride of playing for your high school that makes a huge difference. So, uh, I mean, but to offer an opportunity, you know, that's another thing too. So, <clears throat> bring us to present day. You mentioned you folded up your team, um, and I know that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis you're you're delivering the mail. Yeah, I'm a mailman. I'm uh, I walk for a living. <laughs> which is funny considering all the maladies that you <laughs> you've uh, garnered over the years. But you hip replaced, couple knees. Two knees, a hip, pacemaker. No. Fit as a fiddle though these days. I, yeah, I lost 25 pounds when I started last last year, about a year ago this time. I lost 25 pounds. I went from 187 to 165, 162. So strong. I don't even what tell. Blake's, Blake's looking at the bench. I haven't guy. seen that number since I was 11. <laughs> it's funny because I have. I, I mean, my my professional playing weight in college playing weight was 172, and I'm under that. Wow. So. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever get under, <laughs> under my college playing weight. Yeah, higher at the post office. Yeah. <laughs> It's a busy season, Christmas season coming up, man. You should exactly. consider that. You should consider that. Real estate's <laughs> kind of still in your face. So, uh, so I, I can't imagine you're not going to coach again. I can't. I, I just don't see that as a possibility unless you die really quickly. No, <laughs> I, God forbid. I always joke about that, too. So that I don't, that I, just yeah, throw that out. Because you know me. You know me a little bit. <laughs> that wasn't as morbid as it sounded. Yeah. Um, no, you know, it's funny. Justin said it, too. I was walking my route the other day, and there's kids – you know, playing in the, for the ball in the yard. And I was like, I just I wanted to stop. Like, I'm on a, I'm kind of on a timer with my hour. I got to finish a certain time. So I got to make sure if, I, if I'm on schedule or I'm ahead of schedule, if I can do that. You know, I, uh, but you know, you, I want to do it. You know, I said I want to, and I, I think I will. I, 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 I'm on the overtime list now, which means I'm at their beck and call, you know, six days a week. For that, but that's good. Yeah, yeah, it's good for me, um, especially because the weather's been so nice lately too. So. <laughs> You know, when the weather starts blowing sideways snow and rain, then it, it might change my mind. But I thought about getting off the overtime list in January, January, February, March, and, and doing some kind of preseason high school stuff. You know, soccer aerobics kind of thing that I, I swear by. I've, been, I've done it for 35 years with Golden Sears Camp, and I, 
you know, as hard as it is to do and as, you know, as much as I rolled my eyes at it when I started doing it, I, I think it's one of the best programs for balance, strength, and... As someone who's done it, I would agree. Although, I did watch the video somewhat recently, and it's it's hilarious. Yeah. It's, I mean, I mean it's, ter it's terrible. But, like... You guys should... We need to... Cause I've taught... I mean, I remember talking about it 10 or 15 years ago. I didn't know there was an actual... Video. Does somebody yeah. have the link or something? So, no, we should. Got I've got the DVD. We should we okay. probably like upload it somehow. So, you, so are you again? I, I actually yeah. want to. I was going. I talked to Boba Three the other day actually, and uh, I, I want to ask him if I can. If he'll give me permission to redo the video and, and modern Monetize. clothing. <laughs> well, that's what's and so maybe, funny about it. It's and maybe music, but music. Yeah. Put it in music. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's like the old uh, who was uh, John Bastow or whatever the. Uh, ten, five, eight minute abs. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. But yeah. And it's so funny too because they. Uh, like they, you know, like they'll kind of like focus in on one one guy who's yeah, who gets yeah, yeah. it, um, but and they can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and it's, you have to get through like the first ten or fifteen minutes for anything good because at the beginning it's just like the bouncing and the skipping and the hopping. And, right. But that's uh, important though. And you it think is. about it, it's important. But then you get into hopping, the touch skipping, stuff. jumping, hop, 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 magic hop, <laughs> magic hop, magic hop. You know what? And you think about it. You know that magic hop is is all about your touch. Do you remember, on that real quick note, uh, do you remember when we were down in San Diego, uh, you got sent off and... Uh, Hubert Vogel, coached it. Hubert Vogel, yeah. we, we didn't, I mean, we've heard of this guy, no idea who the guy oh, is, yeah, yeah. all of a sudden... It's funny, because I thought... I didn't I was get to play that game, I got I, sent off too. I, 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 found, <laughs> I found a picture from that tournament, and I was going to bring it, I just, I left it on my desk. That would be the gift that you could give us. Oh, oh man, that's crazy. That would, no, but... I, because you got sent off, I got sent off, and Nick Miller, I think we all got sent off in the same game. It was a total disaster. And so, I don't know. Do you think that could, I mean, so like, <laughs> remember, I mean, we had kids, that was, I mean, that was like arguably a, the ODP team exactly. you know, that we just said, hey, we need to go in front of colleges on our own, and yeah. did it, and. Um, it's funny, because that's what you talked about with Justin, too, you know, and you mentioned it. I don't even, Matt, you didn't even get paid to do that, did you? Like, we paid no, for no, no, I, I we paid for my flight, I think that was it, but. You know, that, but it's crazy. you go there, and, and part of it's up to the individual kid, you know, to, to make contact with coaches. You know, now some of these clubs, a lot of these clubs have college advisors. Advisors, but what do they really do? When, when Justin was making that statement that these kids are going to, VSA is going to St. Louis, and those five, six college coaches aren't there at the game, give me a break. That's the college advisor person that's just there. But I think part of it is the accountability and of the player to, to reach out and say, hey, I'm interested, I'm, we're going to be there, this is our schedule. And I think that's the way we did it. We did it back in the day. I remember with Romantley's team, I mean, like you said, traveling and going to tournaments. I mean, it was cost, of, it was almost cost effective, but, you know, Romantley's team, which was actually ranked ninth in the country at one point, um, we went to Memphis, we went to Atlanta, we went to Nomads, we went to Surf Cup, we went to... President's Cup. You stick it. four guys into a room, <coughs> continental breakfast. Yeah, yep. yeah. And or, you have or somebody's mom would go get bagels and bananas. Two or three parents. Yep. You have two or three parents going for chaperones and driving the vans. So, and, and that's the way you did it. I mean, um, you know, it, it's funny because what, what makes these kids successful? I mean, nowadays, I, we go to tournaments, I take the kids' phones at night. Because otherwise, they'd be on them until 2 o'clock in the morning with their girlfriends. I take all the phones in my room. And I just shut off the charge, and then in the morning at breakfast or the, or the morning stretch or run, they get them back after the morning stretch or run. So I bet they hate you. They do. They do. <laughs> they hate me. Well, you know, it's funny because it, you look at my last gig at, at a state cup game, we were playing a play-in game. And it was a team we'd already beaten handily at, during the season, and three of my best players were out all night. And, you know, we go there, and unfortunately – they didn't have their best game, and we ended up losing three to two on two, whatever. I mean, we lost. I mean, every coach says, oh, we could have, we should have, we could have. But, you know, they weren't better than us, but we gave up three bad goals, or two, actually two really bad goals. So, you know, and that was a playing game that we were, and everybody, VSA was the top team, and Sporting was the second team, and we were that, everybody was afraid to play my team. And, and I was like, and we lost in the playing game. So I was like, it was shocking, and I was gutted. Gut and I talk to the kids all the time, and I said, I, I know, I still feel that in my stomach, that game, because that's a game, there's no way we, you know, we should have been on top. So, so to me, that's a good, uh, like, I've got a good wrap it up question, sort of, not not that we've, yeah, we've, we've taken enough of your time, we don't want, nobody wants to listen to us talk for two hours, so, <laughs> uh, 
thing that, that strikes me about you is obviously your passion, and, but it's not just for the game. You know, a lot of times it's for the players and you know, all that kind of stuff, and, and you're also super competitive. You've kind of got that, like, I don't know if you want to – I mean, obviously, <laughs> listen to somebody talk about how, like, all really competitive people have that sort of attitude of, like, oh, yeah. man, I got, I'm going to go out on my own. I'm going to – you know, you talk about going and kicking the ball for – you know, knocking balls for however long. Um, how has that – helped you, but also how has it like hurt you in your 60 years or how many years? You know, I, I don't know if it's hurt me. I, I, I just, I, I think you got to give. Because you just talked about how much it hurt. You talked about a loss from how long ago. Uh, you know, <laughs> you, you do. And, and you guys as competitive people, both you guys play at high level and you're competitive people. So anybody that's competitive, you know, that setback is, you know, and that one for me was gut-wrenching because, you know, a couple years ago, my Brendan's team, when they were 14, they lost on goal differential. You know, they lost on a goal differential. So, and these kids, and they all came up to me at the post-game gathering. Oh, a lot of Latino kids said, Coach, when's our next game? And I was like, next year? You know, I, I mean, some of the kids don't get it. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, the reward is you, you learn as much from, you probably learn more from losing than you learn from winning as sad as that is, but I, I think as a coach, you know, it just makes you, you know, re reach a little bit deeper for, for solutions to things or, you know, problem solving than you would ever would have done before. And like, like you said, I, I'm passionate about my kids. I, 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 the kids that, that played for me, they're really close, and I keep good contact with a lot of them. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's important that, that they know that you care about them, and that, that makes a difference in how they perform for you. And you know, some people say that, you know, your kids will go for a wall for you. And I said, no, you know, I, I hope they would go for a wall, to a wall for themselves because they got to want it for them more than they want it for me. Yeah, that's a tough one to teach. Yeah. Um, and I know that's probably, like, your biggest struggle of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thanks for spending some time with us. I don't know if you've got anything else, Blake. Or nope, that's good. You uh, I was going to ask you earlier, but you took it. So just, what I mean, where are you going to be? So yeah. we'll find out. Yeah. Stay tuned. Uh, you, got, you got anything you want to leave us with? No, man. Uh, have a good holiday. As scary as it's going to be and how different it's going to be, but um, happy holidays to everybody. Yeah, fingers crossed for no snow, no rain for, for, for me, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the snow is okay. I don't mind the snow. It's the rain. It's Because yeah. you can't keep the mail dry either, and that's a challenge. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's like a coaching challenge. you go, how are you going to solve this problem? <laughs> it's impossible. Well, maybe we'll get into a little plastic bag for <laughs> something for Christmas, <laughs> Coach. <laughs> Thanks again, Matt. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for All right, Thebes. Got to love uh, a little chat with Matt Kennedy. That was pretty fun. That was. Hopefully our listeners uh, enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, good seeing the old Crippler in person. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stories we didn't get to tell. And just real quick, remember the one we had the neck brace on? <laughs> and uh, oh, we were 14 years old. He, had, oh, he so literally cool. had a neck brace. So let's tell the story. So poor coach is there running the, sh running the session for us. And he's, he's in, in a full neck brace like yelling and getting all fired up like normal and then all of a sudden just out of nowhere he's doing a demo and just freezes <laughs> ah <laughs> i think he said a few different words than that but it was ah and oh my gosh and then he just like slowly went down into like a prone position and just laid on the ground and we're all <laughs> like looking at each other what do, what do we do i think that's basically in the story i think we just let him lay there for a little bit and eventually he was okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah good good times well, you know, if, if that tells you anything about Coach, it tells you that he, there's never a session he's not willing to coach, uh, even if he's in bad shape. So, uh, you know, and Matt's the, guy, the kind of guy that uh, would give you the shirt off his back. Um, he's been there for me a lot over the years, and I know the same for you, and helped us get where we got to Absolutely. in our own ways. And, uh, yeah, got to love that guy. So thanks again for Matt for coming on. And uh, what, we got a social media plug now, Steve? I think a lot now. We've got a new website. Yes. We have a supporters club. Yes. Uh, 20 bucks a year. Uh, help support Kick It Forward. You join the supporters club. You got some pretty cool some gifts swag. coming. Swag, yeah. We did some, some major orders there the other day. They're gonna, I think people are going to like that. Um, where can they uh, find us on social media, Steve? So Facebook is at KIF Soccer. Twitter is at KIF underscore soccer. And then Instagram is at KIF Soccer. So basically, we just need to sort our Twitter game out still. I know. Okay. Our Twitter guy needs to work on that. Yeah. Well, you know, 
Again, check out the new website, though. Similar, yes. kifsoccer.com. Yep, right on. Um, so enjoy the chat with, uh, I hope you enjoyed the chat with Matt Kennedy, and then uh, we'll see you next week with uh, a new pod as well.